Good morning. Happy New Year. We're glad that you've joined me again this morning for our Bible class together. Today we continue our study in Ephesians. Today we're in Ephesians chapter 2, the first 10 verses, as we look at something called God's masterpiece. We live in an age where the word branding has become a trite phrase, and it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere. It kind of means self-promotion. Today, everybody wants to promote themselves. They tell about all the good things that they've done through their elab through elaborately staged Facebook and Instagram feeds. They ensure you know the latest accomplishment that they've had, the newest outfit that they were, they're wearing, and their ideal vac vacations. It's all about, look at me. Now, it's kind of infected the church as well, where the term marketing has begun to take a center stage. We need, as some people say, to market the church to the world so they'll hear the gospel. The world needs to experience how wonderful we are, how friendly we are. So we promote programs and events that draw attention to all the things we're doing in the community. But honestly, I think we believe we're trying to draw attention to God, but it's easy to lose focus and lose God in that noise of all the activities and forget what the ultimate goal is. Because God has a different way of getting the world to notice Him. It still has to do with the church, but it doesn't take out Google ads or posts on Facebook. It's more complicated than that. But if the world sees what God is doing, they will be intrigued. So let's find out God's plan to get the attention of the world. Ephesians is all about God putting together one church of, of different and divergent kinds of people so the world will know His power through them. In this lesson, Paul describes a before and after picture and puts us in the mirror. Something dramatic happens in this, in this picture. The first three verses are painted with charcoal colors to indicate our dim position in the world. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In this passage, the term walk is a bookend of two sections. It's found in the first section, first verse. It's also found in the last one. The first describes how we conduct our lives before Christ has ever affected them. He says our, our spirit has the stench of decomposition. The future had no, was no more. There was no life here. So Paul uses this kind of twins, if you will, of words, trespasses and sins, as the mirror he wants us to see ourselves in. Because the term can indicate many things. One is a slip or a fall by the wayside. And one of the other area is that sin strays from the road because we've ignored where we're trying to get. We, we get we, we're drifting and we don't know how we got there. But we get there anyway and we don't take much notice of it. We know better, but we choose poorly. My daughter had a first grade teacher who reminded her students, use your good judgment. Paul said, when it comes to our spiritual lives, we didn't. We knew better, and we did it anyway. Paul wants us to face the reality of what sin really is. It is a failure to be what we would be and ought to be. We are either unwilling or unable to become what God wants us to be and intends us to be. So we're always short of the mark. But where does sin come from? It always comes from a particular diversion. Now I want to ask you a question. Who distracts you the most? Now I guess you can blame TV or you can talk about somebody who wants to always talk to you and there's a distraction. But the, 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 the one we know 
that's the worst distractor in our lives is us. We start thinking about things we need to do and suddenly our mind jumps to another topic and we're far off topic. We don't even know why, how we got there. We distracted ourselves because we didn't want to be in the place we were. Paul says that we've all followed the spiritual values and beings of the world as a dog responds to a dog whistle. All those things floating around that we don't see that are encouraging us to do the wrong things, the, the prince of the air and all of the beings that are there. And But why do we follow them? If we know they're there, if we know what Satan's trying to do, why do we do that? Don't we know better? Well, sure we do, but that's not the point. In the same way, we're the ones who have distracted ourselves. And as Paul says, we have followed this course that continues the work of those who are disobedient because of the desires of our body and mind. Now, we often let those words direct us to very seedy places, those filthy spots in our world and the lives of others. But we're much too sophisticated. We're much too refined to engage in all of those dirty sins. But sin doesn't have it have an ugly face with a wart on its nose. Sometimes it wears makeup, it dresses in tuxedos, it plays tennis. Ladies and gentlemen are sinners because they follow the whim of every, their, of every desire. When Paul describes the works of the flesh, a word, the flesh, he uses in today's lesson, they're not all sensual or immoral things in terms we consider immorality, such as fornication. Listen to what he says in Galatians chapter 5. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you get angry? How about things like character assassination? Now that's too strong a term probably. So let's get more base and basic. Are there people in the world you just don't want to, want to be here? So how do you treat them? Do you call them demeaning names behind their back? Do you share posts that inflame passions and makes other people angry? Do you get irritated that some people have things that in your opinion they don't deserve welcome to the world of sin the works of the flesh hatred envy slander they're all there they create the same problems but sometimes they dress so nicely sometimes they hide so well behind some the masquerade of being polite or forthright, or outspoken, all the good traits we put on ourselves. And so all of the ordinary things in life, the traps all fall into what's covered, the things that we, we tend to do. Those, the respectable sins, such as gossip and looking down on others, lurk in the shadow of, of desire. And it's all because we want something. We want to look important. We want to look better. We want more money. We want more status. We want more of what the world wants. We want to be more like other people. Welcome to the desires of body and mind, like the rest of mankind. The best of us are not better than the worst of us. And none of us can climb out of the pit we have fallen into. It takes something else. It takes God himself. So what did God do? In verse 4, you feel a hard U-turn when you get to the word but. But God, rich in His mercy, because of the great love with which He has loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. What did God do for us? He made us alive in Christ. 
Now that's a word that can mean raised from the dead in the same way that Jesus raised Lazarus from the tomb, but it goes even further than that. We come to life, that dead spirit is brought to life, but we are also sustained in life from that moment forward. The word all encompasses that. God brings us to life and keeps us alive through Jesus, His Son. But it's with Christ. You know, we're joined with Christ to come alive. I think that harks back to Paul's statement in Romans chapter 6, of which, where he talks about the dying and being buried with Christ in baptism, and then being raised with Him. The method is to identify, to go to the grave with Christ, to come back through the same resurrection. We're not only cleansed of past sins through God's plan, but we're sustained in this new life through God's plan. In short, God doesn't make us better. He makes us new. But how did that happen? Well, it doesn't happen on our own. It happens through God's mercy and God's grace. God sees the helplessness of man. And He knows what He needs and how to save Him. And so mercy is when you see something so pitiful and know that you do have the ability to change that situation. That's mercy. When you see the plight and feel the problem and try to, try to deal with it. But grace is the second word and it, comes, it becomes kind of tried to us. It rolls off our tongues easily. We, we, we define it quickly as unmerited favor and go on with it. But what exactly is that? God's never tried with grace. He gives a treasure that can never be repaid. It's a favor that can never be returned. But in fact, it's really more than that. Grace describes the despicable but being treated with kindness. Someone who is unworthy is given a gift despite of himself. We don't get what we deserve, but we also don't get what we deserve. That's grace. It's what caused God to choose Abraham, not because of his worthiness, but because he believed. There was nothing intrinsic in the character of Abraham that made him better than anybody else except that God loved him. Israel became God's chosen people despite, despite their disobedience and their stubbornness. They were not better than any of the other nations. They weren't richer than any of their neighbors. They brought no status to the table. They weren't powerful and mighty. They were helpless and pitiful. But they were God's chosen people simply because God chose them. It was a privilege born of love, not a position or superiority. The propelling force of the change is never us, God is the actor, we're the recipient. He gives the grace and the overabundance of mercy. We're the pathetic child freezing in the cold, brought into a mansion to live. And Paul doesn't want us to miss that point. He emphasizes it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one can boast. As Paul say we're passive, we just sit back and let God pour blessing onto us and go, isn't that great? Have to do, don't have to do anything. That faith is shown in the obedience, and that's the channel through which grace flows. As a pipe carries water to thirsty people, faith carries grace to lost people. But don't confuse the pipe with the water. It's the gift of God, not what you do. None of us earn salvation. None of us deserve what we have. None of us, how good we are, can say we are good enough for God. Because if we could, God would just leave us alone. It's all up to you. He only takes in the hungry and the needy, never the self-sufficient. He says, so don't get on your soapbox and tell people how good you are because God just wanted to have you, and that's it. When my wife's in college, she lives in a college dorm room with a roommate, and one year, right around Christmas time, 
before cl classes ended and everybody went home, there was a stray kitten that was hanging around the dorm rooms. They decided they would adopt a stray kitten because her roommate would take it home and it was going to be a Christmas gift to her sister. You know, so they came in, they loved on this cat and they took care of it and, and fed it and it slept with them. But there was one problem. As cute as that cat was, it had ringworm. And if you ha handled that cat, you had ringworm too. Just remember what grace means is God picks up the stray kitten who has ringworm. That's you and me. And he still picks us up despise, despite the disease that we had. So he can take care of our diseases. Now, what difference does that make? Well, in a single word, Paul captures that. He saved us. Saved. It's a word that we walk over so often that we don't even see it anymore. But it describes an effect. Paul uses a tense that emphasizes not just what happened back there, but what happened back there with the lasting results that we still have. If He saved you, you continue to be saved if, if you have faith in Him. We're saved in God's grace as we remain in God's grace. But Paul's not finished talking about our transaction. And He raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not only does he take in the stray and clean him up, but he also puts him in a privileged place of a child in a palace. He makes us sit down in his presence. The story is what Jesus tells in Luke 15 of the runaway son who, observed, who deserved nothing but trouble. And when he finds himself among the pigs, he comes to himself and he decides to return home. And he'll decide to be a servant. He doesn't need to be a son anymore. The boy will have something to eat. He'll have a place to sleep. But he won't be in the main house with the family. He's willing to take the lowly uh, status of a stable boy. But when he arrives home, his father runs and hugs him. He refuses to listen to his prepared speech of mea culpas. Instead, he puts his son's robe on him, his son's ring on his finger. So he brings him into his house and he sits in the chair of honor as he feasts with him. See, we deserve the servant's course at best. And that would be enough for most of us. But God doesn't do that. He takes us and sits us down with him in the heavenly places in a place of honor, in a place of royalty, in a place of life. We can never get there on our own. But the question why lingers like smoke after a fire. Why would God take someone so consumed with themselves and shower them with such love so undeserved as to make them clean, fresh, and new? Well, Paul wants to answer that question for us. God does have a motive behind all of what he does. His ultimate reason is to get men back to him and in fellowship with him. But the problem is, most people don't notice. He wants them to see something that they could be. In the final verse of this lesson, you see God's motives. For we are his workmanship created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. God had a plan, prepared long before Christ came, and He wanted something to happen. He had a second creation. The second creation was to create a condition in man that he could do good things, not follow his nature, that he could begin to mirror God in how he acted and how he thought and how he loved. He wanted our lives to change in dramatic ways. He wanted our walk to take on a new cadence, as he would say. If God can show people lives so changed, maybe somebody else 
will open their hearts and listen in their despair and desperation. Maybe they see possibilities when God changes somebody else, that in their own life they can be changed as well. In this way, He makes us His workmanship. Now don't ignore that word because it describes the true motive God has for saving us. The word Paul uses is a word that means work of art. And it could describe plays of Shakespeare or the Mona Lisa or Longfellow's poetry. It's something that people look at, linger over, and admire. Now art does something for us. It captures our imagination in ways that we can't turn loose. We wonder how anybody could make something so beautiful, so sublime, when we see something gorgeous. That should be the character that causes people to say, how could God do that? And perhaps they may respond with, I wonder if He could do that to me as well. That's what God change in our lives is to be. But in Ephesians, it means something even more than personal change. Remember that Ephesus was a blended city and by the church, by extension, was a blended church. It was filled with slave masters and slaves, men and women, and Jew and Gentiles, rich and poor. They had all different kinds. People who never mixed in society. People who would never stand in the same street corner together. They would never eat in houses together. They would never associate together because they were so different. One was much better, much higher, more noble than the other. But if God could change human tendency of the people who hate each other, who despised those who were not like them, who felt superior over those they detested, and put them together in a church, he could get the world's attention. The world can't do all of this. The world can't change people enough that they become like this. See, he's, he reasons if people could change enough to care for each other, even though they would naturally do it, build up each other, even though they would never do it normally, love each other, even though they may be unlovable, forgive each other, even for the slights, and stop seeing the differences and stop start seeing the kinship, might not the world want something of the change that it sees? This is the portrait of His people that God wants to paint. Changed people living together with Jesus as their head, reaching out to those who are untouchables. That's a picture you never see hanging in the world's gallery that's filled with hate, rivalry, and self-serving. God wants the world to know Him. He wants the world to obey Him through the faithful obedience to His Son. But how is He going to do that? How is He going to have them do it willingly? Someone who says, I have to have this in my life. Because he reach, the way he does it, he reaches down and changes the ugly into beauty. He takes them from being a curse to being blessed. He showers us with grace, undeserved in mercy, sorely needed. And he wants the world to see the change in you and me and take notice of the art that he has created through the blood of his son. Too many times we put of we do as a, what we do as a church on display rather than what God does to us on display. Are we to show our own importance or God's power? Are we going to show our own abilities or God's grace? It's so. Because sometimes we cleanse our own motives and we see ourselves as pure as we ought to be. That we're really good people, then people need to be like us. Rather than saying, we need you to come and see our Master. 
If people see great programs among average lives, they will yawn and say, oh, another paint-by-number life. But instead, God creates a masterpiece out of the ash cans of our lives. God wants to display the change that He makes by grace through faith in Christ Jesus. And He wants to show His great power in the church. Can all of the redeemed come together to show what God has done? A few years ago, the holiday sounds were unusual. 400 musicians, ranging from a nine-year-old cellist to an octogenarian oboist, assembled to play a new piece of music, and none had a suitable instrument. There were bows with little hairs and a trumpet being held together by blue painter's tape. But David Lang had brought together the Philadelphia's 23rd Street Armory group to perform his piece, Symphony for a Broken Orchestra. And Lang found another way to make a melodic sound, even though funds had been cut to schools. All of these musicians, with nothing more than banged up, broken instruments, came together to make music. The sound started at the beginning as, as atrocious. The French horn couldn't hold its mouthpiece. But as the work progressed, the instruments blended into harmonizing sounds. The music ended with each instrument going silent, one by one. The last note was a squeak by a dilapidated clarinet. We expect the best, the shiniest, the most expensive when we go to the orchestra. Because your standard orchestras contain tuned woodwinds and dynamic brass or timpani and gong are the best available. Who brings a broken instrument to an orchestra? God does, in something called the church. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you're enjoying your holiday. I'll see you again next Sunday.